and welcome back to the Purple Chair. My name's Elia Harding, Youth Ambassador for the END FGM Network EU, and I am joined with another special guest, Elise, from Young Women's Advisory Council from Forward UK. And today we're going to be talking about um, domestic violence and some of the impacts it has had um, on BAME women. So Elise, before we go any further, would you like to introduce yourself, tell us a bit more about the Young Women's Advisory Council and Young Women's Hub and how young women can get involved? Yeah, so um, like I said, my name's Elise um, and I'm co-chair of the Young Women's Advisory Council for Forward UK. Um, and Forward is an African women's led organisation working to end violence against women. Um, Typically, it started from um, trying to end female genital mutilation in the UK and in, uh, in Africa, um, and, and it's expanded since then. Um, and our role as the Young Women's Advisory Council is to advise on um, issues that affect young women. Um, as we know, FGM typically takes place at a young age. Um, so any campaigns, for example, that Ford might want to target towards young women or um, increase participation among young, young women, they will come to us, you know, for um, advice um, or, or expertise in how to market towards them or increase engagement in that area. And um, for those who want to keep up to date or get involved in some way, we have loads of events going on at Forward. Even during COVID, COVID we've got loads of virtual events, so not to worry there. Um, yeah, you guys have been really active on that. Really well done. Amazing work. Yeah, you had really good um, turnout. So I would love to see anyone who's watching this video um, come along to any of our online events. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to know about any, I would definitely recommend uh, following Forward on Twitter. It's at Forward UK um, to just keep up to date with everything that's going on. Um, mm -hmm. And if you want to volunteer and get involved in, in some sort of capacity there, um, just drop drop them an email. It's uh, forward at forwarduk.org.uk. Amazing. Thank you so much. So before we continue, I'm just going to give like a brief summary about domestic violence. Domestic violence is um, a form of abuse within personal relationships. It can be carried out by a partner, an ex-partner, and um, perpetrators can also be family members or carers. Um, and I think one thing that I want to like establish um, right now, um, when we are talking about domestic violence throughout this video, we are not just um, referring to physical abuse. Um, domestic violence takes many forms um, and is carried out in acts such as um, coercive control, economic abuse, sexual harassment. Um, and I think with the increase of technology and social media, digital abuse is on a rise and, in and is increasing rapidly. So it's good to bear that in mind. Um, so I think as we go forward um, we also want to talk about um, gender and domestic violence you know you often hear in conversations oh but men are victims too right um, and I think while this is true you know time and time after again over the years statistics have shown and research have shown that women are um, disproportionately um, affected and this is because domestic um, violence is deeply is a crime that's deeply ro rooted in the inequality between men and women so when we think about domestic violence we are thinking about a gendered we're talking about a gendered issue and seeing it within that context Women who are already ex experiencing other forms of gender-based violence like forced marriage, child marriage, FGM, you know, it, it creates a further barrier to disclose. And sometimes when you think about crimes that are happening within like a family setting, a, a personal relationship, you do you think that that is your duty to endure and it's not as you can't compare it to like a, like a physical crime or something where something which is very like out there um so yeah um i don't know if there's anything that you want to add elise um on domestic violence to be a gendered issue i know that um 
being a part of a council that advises young women and work and works with young women maybe you can highlight some of the barriers that young women face um when seeking support um well I'll, i think a key thing that we should recognize when we're talking about this issue is that there's no such thing as normal behavior mm. so what we believe to be normal is what we're socialized to believe to be normal and i think this definitely comes into play when we're talking about gender and why uh, domestic abuse is is gendered because men are often socialized one way and women are often like, often socialized another way and um encouraged or um to adopt certain traits associated with being a woman or being a man um and so when we're talking about normal normal is defined as what we're socialized to believe normal is mm. um, so a victim of abuse may not recognize that what they're experiencing is abuse because they just might see it as normal um, and i love this analogy because it puts in, in such simple terms if your whole life you're told that the sky is green and then someone comes along one day and says actually it's blue you know the most likely response is going to be denial you know no it's just it's just green so i think yeah. the a real barrier is getting someone to recognize that what they're experiencing is abuse mm -hmm. um, and i think also you know I, I did touch on this just now um, when talking about how women and men are socialized but you know culture can really sort of exacerbate this um you know a lot of cultures they might promote domestic abuse in some form as as a, as a form of discipline yeah uh, and submissiveness of a woman you know a yeah. woman submissive and yeah so definitely exactly like like the the female traits that women are socialized to have you know yeah. um so you know loads of cultures sort of promote that or um some cultures might promote keeping domestic issues in-house i think that's e even the uk you mm. know i i couldn't remember off the top of my head when um you know uh, marital rape was was outlawed in the uk but it was relatively recently it was in my mum's lifetime for example mm. um so e even in the uk we have this this culture of what happens in the house that's not my business you know that mm. needs to stay in house or you need to stick by your partner mm. no matter what you what you experience so i think culture can really um sort of compound that um mm. i would say another barrier um to, to seeking support would be a uh, fear of retribution um mm -hmm. and it's a very much a valid concern um mm -hmm. you know we know that women are most likely to be harmed or killed when they're trying to leave an abusive situation not when they're staying in it um yeah. and this can really be i guess compounded when there are children involved yeah um, we know that you know in intimate partner violence children can also can be used as sort of leverage so someone might threaten to harm a child if if you leave you know or um stop you from ever seeing your child again you know that sort of thing so not just the fear of retribution for yourself but also for, for your loved ones particularly children um mm -hmm. can really be a bar barrier when uh, seeking support mm -hmm. um another one i would say and this one isn't spoken about as much um but you know we both work in the field of you know serving black women in particular and migrant women um so insecure citizenship status is yeah. is a real barrier to seeking support um mm -hmm. a lot of women who aren't who don't have secure citizenship in this country might feel like they can't call the police for example if they're in a dangerous situation because they themselves will be arrested and deported or they can't um seek help from a charity or a charitable organization because the char charity will be uh, forced to report them yeah. Um, that's, that's a real uh, major concern um, and I guess um, another one would be uh, finances so um, I mean if someone has no recourse to public funds in particular um, this again kind of like if you have an insecure citizenship status um, might lead someone to believe that a charity um, cannot serve them or yeah. um, the police cannot serve them mm -hmm. um, but even if you do and you know you, you're a citizen of this country and um you you know you have the right to nhs etc um if you're if the abuser um has control of all the finances in the household you might uh, be discouraged from seeking help because you don't want to become more financially insecure or potentially homeless you know uh, many women might live in a house with with an abuser who um who owns the house or yeah. you know, say it's, it's a parental abuser etc that really yeah. complicates things and, and makes someone think you know if i if i seek help 
how will my uh, quality of life change in that way? Great, I think you made such a good point of crimes that happen within a family setting. And I just wanted to add on that, like a lot of crimes are silenced by honour. You know, what happens in the household stays in the household, whatever, and we'll do with it as a community, we'll do with it as a family. And that keeps um, victims of domestic violence trapped. It's a form of, you know, another form of abuse because you're not allowing them to fulfill their rights as a human being. You know, yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of crimes that are silenced by honour. Um, so that was an amazing point that you made um, regarding that. And I think especially during this whole pandemic, worldwide camp, um, pandemic, we've seen impacts of domestic abuse, like rain, like a, a, a wide range, basically. And I think one of the, when we're talking about, you were talking about culture um, and the role that plays, I think one thing, one another barrier that that women i wouldn't say a barrier but an impact of domestic abuse that's not often sp um, spoken about um is mental health the the impact as a mental health i feel like culturally there's no such thing as being depressed there's no such thing as being an anxious as women um and um, women from um a minority ethnic groups especially there's this assumption within our culture that we should be strong it is our duty as a woman we don't have safe spaces to express ourselves it's very unlikely that we will be asked how was your day or how can i support you and i feel like we've seen that growing up um as well like it we, our parents or um women in our life may not have been in a in a, a victim of of violence but I think those little traits come into play where you know no one really asks the asks women how they feel so this also I think plays a, a, a part in in no this also impacts greatly um, women and maybe their resistance to seek support because because they're not understood um, mental health is not in, uh, understood with people that they love they think who else is is going to get me um yeah. that wasn't that was another important important um, point that you you raised um you also mentioned about um migrant women and women who may not have um residents and that insecurity um and i feel like especially where a lot of services have become digital there's this expectation that everyone has access to a laptop everyone has access to a smartphone and that is not the case so this is another barrier for women to seek the support that they need not only um whether it's financially you know with online banking there's just so many hurdles um when you move things digital you are not considering the most marginalized groups and most marginalized women so i think that's another um a barrier that has that has come up that i've seen um and I, i'm aware that forward has done um a research um on the impacts um that covid has had on on BAME women um, maybe you can share some key findings um, and highlight some issues with, within that report yeah so um, we sent out a survey essentially um, during lockdown at the peak of, uh, of the pandemic um, to ask what uh, were the issues um, that BAME women were most concerned about during lockdown mm -hmm. um, and a key concern highlighted you know and, and you highlighted earlier was is the mental health mm. um, and I think this also corresponds with you know a limited contact with your support system you know you can't go and meet up you, uh, with your friends you can't go to your mum's house for example um, and that and that too corresponds with the rise of domestic violence during this pandemic um, mm. you know we know that a support system can assist in removing women from abusive situations and we know how dangerous those are when you're trying to leave that situation so all of these things um, are interconnected i guess you could say um, but also the research revealed that uh, another large concern was uh, financial insecurity um, mm -hmm. you know, we're in a recession now many in industries have been severely affected by you know coronavirus and lots of people have lost their jobs um, and we also know that there's a large financial element in domestic violence i mean 
financial control, control of the finances of a household is a form of, of power and control um, and, and can become abusive. And, and this can be exacerbated when a woman doesn't have her own independent source of income. And, you know, now a woman is less likely to have her own independent source of income. She's much more likely to have lost her job. Um, so again, this will also correspond with the rise of domestic violence in, in the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. and as you said, you know, working from home has increased with the lockdown. Um, people are expected to do things digitally, but with that also means that also the, ha the household is in contact for more hours of the day. And that also means that, you know, contact between abuser and victim is greatly in increased and that increases opportunity um, for abuse. So I think the, the report, um, the findings of the report really correspond with um, key areas of domestic violence. Um, and, and that really uh, reflects the, the trend in domestic violence that we've seen dur during the pandemic. Apologies for the abrupt ending. The conversation went so in depth that we decided to make a part two. In the next video, we will be sharing some resources around community support and highlighting some information that may support you with your activism. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.